Thank you all for coming. The, the course of the day will be somewhat flexible. I've got kind of an order of what we're going to do. The first part will be Steve Lampin talking about cable, which he knows so well. Uh, the second part will be a demonstration and a discussion of connectors and uh, terminating the cables that Kurt Denke will show us and lead. Uh, the third part will be measurement that uh, Kurt and Mac Perkins and Rick Rodriguez will talk about and show. Uh, the fourth part will be messing around with the consoles and cables there. Um, th there will be a break around 12.30 or so for lunch and uh, you can either stay here and order the takeout like I've been saying or if you brought something you can eat it or you can go somewhere and grab something or you can just stay and not eat which is probably what I'll do because uh, I don't eat lunch. Uh, and then we'll get into wherever we stopped and didn't finish, we'll just continue and uh, we'll wrap it up around 4.30 or 5 or something uh, to get all this stuff out of here. Um, and uh, this is not a prepared presentation, so excuse the uh, fluffs and uh, confusion that will inevitably occur, but I think it's going to be an interesting time. This event was triggered by uh, an event where I set up my sound systems and was able to unintentionally disrupt the signal on the CAT cable by pulling it. Uh, and that was confusing because uh, I didn't think that was possible. And uh, I looked into it and found that this subject is very large and not many people, if anybody, knows all of the parts of it. Everybody that I've talked to knows some of it, but they don't know the full thing. So I thought it would be great to get together as a group and share information. So I'm hoping that it will be uh, not a, completely a presentation, but a, that you will contribute if you have something that you know about or an experience that you've had, that you will throw it in as appropriate during the course of the day. I'm going to be somewhat aggressive about limiting the conversation and directing it. Um, we don't want to go off on a half hour tangent, but it, I, I'll tell you every time I've talked with any of these guys about this subject, we've talked for an hour and have not scratched the surface, so it's going to be a full day, I think. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Steve, and I think this is you. That was it, yeah. Yep, okay. Okay. Well, thank you for having me here. I'm delighted always to be in the Northwest. In fact, it seems like I never leave. I mean, Kurt and I, he's my customer now, and uh, we, we're talking all the time, so it's like, and there's so many other people I know. I'm, a lot of you already know me, and I kind of travel around. I'm never at home. I just got back from the Nordic countries uh, last week, actually, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Finland. Uh, in the middle of that, I went to Dubai, which they didn't tell me wasn't close to Finland. I thought, you know, <laughs> no, it was a long way off, but uh, that's the only way it fit together. Oh, is that what it is? No way, I did Denmark as well. But, uh, um, and so the point is, I brought back some cables with me from Europe, which uh, don't exist here yet, but you can look at them and, and slather and uh, you know, drool at them. And eventually they might be available because we're trying to internationalize our cables so that everybody gets everything, which is a radical new idea for us, you know. So I uh, wish us luck with that. But I can show you what they have that you don't have, for instance. Um, so what I'm going to talk about here, as you can see, I just actually changed the title of this to the history of category cables. Because if you don't know where you've come from, then you don't know where you're going. And in fact, there's, uh, I actually start here with the history of Ethernet, but there's a lot of history before that uh, in terms of understanding twisted pairs, in terms of understanding data. Uh, I mean, that's the thing. This could be a five-hour presentation, and I have 40 minutes. So um, I'll do what I can here. Um, so let me just start with these guys. Uh, this is really uh, the history of Ethernet, which is kind of what we're talking about. I mean, you know, the Ethernet and twisted pairs and coax and data are all separate things. Some people put them all together and assume they're kind of together, but they're not at all. Um, and, and for instance, uh, Ethernet really started with that guy on the left, Norm Abramson who back in the late 60s was given a job of wiring up the Hawaiian Islands. 
which sounded like a really interesting project, especially when they didn't have any money to do it, like all good projects. <laughs> and so we, what he did was put ads in the papers at major universities like MIT and UC Berkeley and places like that saying, free Hawaiian vacation, we'll fly you out here if you're a graduate student in computer science. Now the interesting thing is in the late 60s, the first master's degree in computer science was 1968. So, I mean, this is just at that point when there were a few kids who were figuring out that there might be something interesting here. One of them was uh, Bob Metcalf, who was at MIT at the time, and he answered this ad and they flew him out. And the interesting thing was they had already begun to wire up the Hawaiian Islands. Now the problem with the islands is the fact that they are the tallest mountains on Earth, most of which is underwater. So to get from this island to the island you can see over there, you have to go down 30,000 feet and back up 30,000 feet which is virtually impossible to do and super expensive. And so uh, Norm hit the, on the idea of doing it by radio. That's the whole thing, doing data on radio at the time. Wireless was considered uh, you know, uh, groundbreaking from that standpoint. And so he had all the islands all transmitting and the problem of course is when they're all transmitting, nobody gets anything through because there are all these collisions. And uh, into this fray came Bob Metcalf who had just taken a course in the statistical process, statistical analysis of computer data, which sounds like the craziest thing in the 60s to who would take that course, you know? Probably three kids in the class. But it was exactly what he needed to solve this problem of the Hawaiian Islands. By the time he left, he had that network up to 85% efficiency because what it would do is it would transmit, then if there was a collision, they would stop, they would uh, pick a, a, an average time to retransmit and then they wouldn't hit each other the second time around. And you would collect all your data. Oh, that's another thing that Norm Abrams invented was chopping the data into words, 8-bit words. That was his invention. And so the point is you take these words and put them in the correct order because they all have addresses and then you can read a line of data. And, and this was all his invention and they were just doing this by the seat of their pants, as you can imagine. So Bob Metcalf went back to MIT, got his doctorate. He's Dr. Bob Metcalf. I actually had dinner with him a few months ago, which is interesting, talking about new things coming in Ethernet, like Ethernet AVB, which I don't know if we'll get today, but if you want to talk about it, I'll be glad to. And uh, he didn't even know what that was. So lest you think that you're behind the eight ball and not ahead of it, here's the guy who invented Ethernet who didn't even know what's happening to Ethernet today. So, um, but what happened was he and another guy, Dave Boggs, were hired by Xerox, you know, the copy people, and they thought that they were going to be the next IBM, which is a long story in itself because uh, uh, Chester Carlson had originally uh, tried to interest IBM in buying Xerox and creating uh, that. And uh, Tom Watson Jr. said, well, making copies of documents can't be a feasible business by itself and turned them down. So this is payback time where Chester Carlson comes back and tries to become the next IBM. And so he hired these guys, Bob Metcalf and Dave Boggs, to create the operating system. And he had, of course, Bob Metcalf, all this experience with, you know, putting stuff into words and collisions and retransmission and all this stuff. And they put, literally put it all together. And the funny thing is they kept this joke name, the joke name that they called in Hawaii, uh, that's really Aloha Net was the name of the network. But this system, this operating system, they called it Ethernet because it was going through the ether, you know, by radio. That's a joke, and it's a joke that has stuck with us to this very day. It's still a joke. <laughs> Ethernet, you know? There's nothing about the ether in any of this stuff. So the whole point is on this date, May 23rd, 1973, they sent a whole megabit of data across their lab at the Xerox Research Center. And uh, this was on coax, by the way. And uh, all this stuff started out on coax. In fact, very, the first computers were all on coax. Nobody ever thought about twisted pairs as being a medium that you could use for data. And uh, all these coaxes like thick net and thin net, uh, we still make. They're still in the Belden catalog. We still sell them. Don't ask me who's buying them. Uh, that, I have no idea. But the point is we still make these thick net, thin net. You might even, anybody install some of these? Weird stuff. Yeah, see? Okay, ancient. Ancient guy over here. Yeah. With vampire taps, we actually mark on the thick net cable where you put the vampire tap and you screw it down and it pushes the thing through to the center conductor to make the contact, if you can believe that. And then you have drop cables, which are the smaller stuff, the thin net. And then people found out, hey, you can use any 50 ohm coax for this. So they started having cheap net and then crap net and, you know, it's like, <laughs> and, and they all kind of worked, you know, some better than others and pretty much like the twisted pairs today. So 
And then there's all these variations, ArcNet and things like that. And then along comes IBM. Oh, and by the way, I should say also that at one point Xerox gave up on their bid to be the next giant computer company. And if you see one of their computers that's in a museum now, because uh, they pretty much gave up and fired these two guys. And the whole idea of Ethernet, yes? They also failed to catch a number of things that they created. Oh, no question about it. Oh, there are all sorts of uh, astounding things that they let go by, no question. Uh, the funny thing is the one thing that Xerox kept was the name Ethernet. They still own that word. What they're going to do with it, it's kind of too late to sue people about it, but uh, you know, you never know. Um, so along comes IBM after this and says, you know, uh, we need to first of all create a research center, which they did, the Almaden Research Center. It's still there in San Jose, not far from where I live in San Francisco. I've been there. And uh, those scientists, brainiacs, I mean, when you have a think tank, like this is the first real think tank, I don't, how can you tell when they're working, you know? I mean, it looks like the same when they're not working, you know? It's just like they're, they're thinking, you know? And I guess it's when they produce stuff at the end of the day. And one of the ideas they said is, you know, we really should revisit this idea of twisted pairs carrying data. Because twisted pairs will do one thing that coax will never do, and that is reject noise when it's hooked up as a balanced line. Now, I'll tell you, I could go from here into a one-hour discussion about balanced lines and how those work. Something that audio people work as well. It's all the same stuff. But now we're talking about balance lines running megahertz of bandwidth. And the point is, so these pairs will reject noise, which coaxes won't do. And there are lots of other advantages as well, some of which are size and things like that, and cost. And so they brought out called IBM Type 1, which was the first twisted pair. It's a foil shielded twisted pairs, two pairs in a cable. And of course, designed by engineers, not designed by installers. This is you know, the closest to perfection they could come. Well, the ideal impedance, for instance, is 150 ohms. If you think about this, in coax, the lowest loss is 75 ohms, and 275s is 150 ohms. You follow this? So they brought out 150 ohm twisted pairs, two in a, in a cable. This thing was the size of a garden hose. I mean, it's huge, you know? <laughs> Uh, the perfect example of a cable designed by engineers who would never have to install any, right? Because it was impossible to install, but boy did it work well. It had super low capacitance, I mean I have little specs down there of how good it is. And the whole point is, so what they did was prove that you could run data down twisted pairs. That was given. And they also brought out IBM Type 1A and Type 2. 1A actually expanded the bandwidth to 400 megahertz on a twisted pair, which at the time they started at 16 and suddenly went to 400. Oh my God, this is crazy talk. 400 megahertz? And the reason they're doing that is to do this new thing called video to the desktop. <gasps> oh my God, the people are going to actually look at videos on their computers. Oh, this is just the greatest thing since sliced bread, you know, which shows you how long ago this was. So <clears throat> they have proved that twisted pairs will carry data, but clearly these cables are way too big. Now they had a very cool connector on it, uh, a hermaphroditic connector, you know, male and female. You couldn't put the wrong one on the cable because they all fit together. And the last major building to have IBM Type 1 put in it was Sears Tower when that was built in Chicago, okay? That gives you kind of an idea of the time. So the whole point is they had proved twisted pairs would work, but a lot of people came and said, look, I have these telephone cables here. Those have twisted pairs. Why can't I use those? Well, they're not good enough, you know? They, we have to make them better. We have to fix the pair. And plus they said, well, all those IBM things, those are all shielded pairs. Do we really have to have shields on them? Well, not really. I mean, they'll work fine without shields. And believe me, there's another hour discussion right there of shields and not shields, you know, which I'd be glad to have. Invite me back. I'll tell you all about that stuff. <laughs> but the whole point is, so um, people started to make twisted pairs for data. And the problem is, it was all over the map in terms of the quality, you know? Some were great, some were horrible, and some were in between. And so how do you know what you're getting? And so one company, Annexter, you probably know who they are, a distributor, finally decided, screw this, we're just gonna measure everybody and put them in some kind of order, which they called levels. They still have a level program, although they don't use it very much anymore. But the point is, so they said level one, two, three, four, five, and it said something about the quality of the performance of the cables. Now this idea really hit on uh, this committee, 
which was just formed at the time, the Electronic Industry Association, the Telecommunication Industry Association, uh, and 568 is the number of the committee. And so they were given the job, hey, let's, let's do this twisted pair for data thing. Let's create some standards. Now, we can't use the word levels because they already took levels for Annixter. Let's call it uh, categories. And that's what they came out with, with categories. Now, first they said category one is any twisted pair that's out there. In other words, they're not invent, reinventing anything. They're just saying, you got a twisted pair, we'll call that category one. Now, if you have a twisted pair that's intended for data, like all these pairs that they were playing with at the time, we'll call that category two. But the first one that they actually designed by themselves and said, here's a spec sheet, here's the requirements, here's crosstalk, here's attenuation and all this stuff that you have to meet, that was category three. That was the first one that they actually invented as a committee, so to speak. And which is why category three is still with us. Now it's interesting that it's still with us, not because of something they did, but because the FCC, once they got wind of this, said, wait a minute, all the stuff that's coming into people's homes now well, some of it's the telephone, but a lot of it's now data. And we're worried about emissions, you know, and <clears throat> signals interfering with each other. That's a big deal, you know, part 15 and all that. And so they said, well, let's stipulate that all the wiring going into the people's houses has to be category three or higher, which is why category three would have long ago gone and you would never have seen it, except they made it the standard for all the phone wiring in the US. <laughs> The funny thing is now, you look at the phone wiring they put into your new house, it's all 5 or 5E or something, because that's just cheap as cheap now. I'm not even sure if you can find category 3, even though it's still part of the spec, and they cannot drop it because the FCC is using it. Now, that's not the same for category 4, which went up to a blistering 20 megahertz of bandwidth, because as soon as they brought category 5 out, which is 100 megahertz, suddenly that was the death knell for category four. And that's what's happening all the way along is that as we go along and we have something better, they drop something down below. So they don't have too many standards to choose from. You know, that gets really confusing. But CAT5 really was the thing that really opened the door. 100 megahertz band with 100 megabits of data rate, that's a lot on a twisted pair cable. And I mean, here's a category 5E, which is pretty close to the same thing. The difference between 5 and 5E is that 5E is intended to run the data on all four pairs simultaneously instead of one pair transmit and one pair receive, which has been a, a, until this point. Suddenly all four pairs are running both directions at the same time, something called duplex mode. And unless you think that's insane, that's what your telephone already does, is duplex mode. You have two wires, you talk and receive at the same time, you know, on those two wires. Well, they're doing the same thing only at 100 megabits and 100 megahertz bandwidth. So the, the whole point is uh, 5E is tested differently than CAT5 because all four pairs are being used. And things like the delivery of the signals on the four pairs is now critical, something called delay skew, which didn't exist before. You had one pair go and one pair come, and nobody cared when they got there. Now suddenly it's important. And uh, the impedance of the pairs, something called return loss, is now a spec. I mean, there are four or five other things that are in the 5E spec that weren't in the 5 spec. So it's not exactly a different cable. It's the same cable, but it's now measured differently. And a few people had to go back and redesign their cables because they wouldn't meet the 5E spec. Then we get to category six. Now, here's the interesting thing. When you go from 100 megahertz to 250 megahertz, which is what this is, the reason you're doing this is to make the boxes at the ends cheaper. Because when you have more bandwidth, you have more lanes on the highway, you can get more cars through more easily. This is what they're talking about. The funny thing is, which most people don't know, is that once they brought out CAT6 cable, nobody who made boxes did anything at all. There are no CAT6 boxes. There are no CAT6 drivers or receivers. They never existed. Nobody ever made them. So uh, lots of people put in CAT6 cable now for stuff, which is higher bandwidth and better performance. And you know, there are lots of things that are nice about it. But the things that's actually running down is still that Cat5 box kind of stuff until we get to 10 gig. Yes? No, no. These are all unshielded. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, you can get shielded versions if you want shielded versions. And that's the thing. We can talk about shielding versus unshielding. And we actually have some shielded and unshielded samples here to show you. And uh, if you're in Europe, they, they're major shielded. But I think that's mostly paranoia. You know, they're scared that the airplane will crash or the pacemaker will stop working because the unshielded cable will radiate or something. And none of these things have ever happened. We live in an unshielded world over here in the US, and Europe is conflicted because half of it's shielded and half of it's unshielded, and nobody cares. So, but these are all unshielded, I'm showing you here. You, if you, there was a shield, you would probably I'd try to show you the shield. This is just four pairs. And the, the point is, by the time you get to 250 megahertz and category six, there's, the specs are different. The standards are different. And that's one of the things which people don't realize is that the, the 568 committee has a list of specifications. Here's a crosstalk, here's attenuation, here's this and that and this. They don't care how you get there. If you could do this on a Dixie cup and a string, they'd be perfectly happy. <laughs> so the point is how people get to those numbers is completely non-standard. And that's why if you look at some of these cables and you compare them and say, well, look at this one's completely different than that one. Yeah, there's no standard as to how you build the cable. It's just getting to numbers, getting to those specs. Do the specs specify durability? No. Nope. Okay. No. Nope. Although you can buy, you know, factory floor durable versions of these or, you know, tactical cables. Yes? Do they specify uh, connector types? No. Nope. No. Nope. Just performance. And that's, see, that's the interesting thing. So if you could figure out how to get there, I mean, obviously, if you're going to plug it into a box that exists and that has an RJ45, then that's the plug you're going to use. So you don't have any choice there. So the question is, that's a good question because the RJ45 started in 1960 as a T1 connector, you know, 1.544 megabits. And now suddenly we're at 250 megabits or 1,000, a gigabit, you know? And we're putting it through this, you know, you know, it's like putting, uh, taking your Ferrari to big O tires, you know. I'm like, oh, I'm not sure if this would work on the racetrack. Maybe going to the supermarket's okay. Yes? Flat cable, I mean, basically, uh, if you could do a flat cable, it meant the spec, even though it's not. Yeah, oh yeah. Well, that's the thing. That one on the left is not round. It's kind of a crescent shape, and we have some of it here. This was... One of our breakthroughs in 1995, it's almost 20 years old now. I guess you can pass this around. And the point is what it does is spread the pairs apart by putting them in a, each in their own channel because that's how you get to the crosstalk. The other way to get to the crosstalk numbers is put something in between the pairs. You see the one on the right, you can clearly see that divider in there which is pushing the pairs apart. That's to get to these new crosstalk numbers required by category six. Yes. No, they no, they never did. Again, it's just what works. And I'll, I'll be honest to say that we were the people who started this gauge size thing, and I'm very sorry about it. Except what we realized was larger wire is lower resistance, which will go farther and lower loss. And so we said, well, how big a wire will actually fit into the connector? And that's where we hit upon 23 gauge, which is a weird gauge. It didn't even exist before we tried this. And since we draw our own cable, we could draw our own 23 gauge wire as well. And so we started making 23 gauge. Now suddenly everybody's making 23 gauge. But there's nothing in the spec that says it has to be any gauge. It just has to have this attenuation and crosstalk. Likewise, was there a spec similar as the expectation of printing versus soldering in other ways of attaching? Oh, I don't think they care how you connect it as long as it works. The thing is that crimping has been shown over and over again to be a much better way of making a connection, unless you could figure out a better way of making a connection. And that's one of the things that I was just thinking before I was talking here, is that, you know, what's a perfect cable? A perfect cable is one where it, it, the, the connector has disappeared. There is no connector, you know? It's just, you know, continuous cable. It just happens that there's a thing in the middle, but you can't see it, it doesn't do anything, and the signal goes right through. That's much harder to do than you think it is which is why the connector is one of the major places where failure occurs, simply because it's not as good as the cable. Do you have, do you have a terabit here? Cable? Not yet. We're getting close. How far, how, how far away are you from uh, competing with fiber? 
Well, that's the thing. I mean, we're also talking about distances as well. And if you're talking about long distances, you're going to be in fiber. This is all 100 meters kind of stuff. Where you, know, you have a building, you only have to go five feet or ten feet or fifty feet. Do you have a maximum speed that you're going to reach? We currently do, which is 10 gig. This is our current top of the line, 10 gigabits per second. Now we're working on the next one called category eight, which is going to be 40 gigabits. I haven't seen any, but it, it's going to be individually shielded pairs, which is kind of like this. This is stuff from Europe. This has all sorts of shields on it. And, and this is actually category seven from Europe but you can't see inside, but individually shielded pairs. Uh, there's no connector that we're even aware of that you can put on this. This is only for punch down. That's the thing. You, so, and the, this is a problem here, is how do you connect those individual shields, you know, and isolate them, or do you just combine them, in which case you might as well have had an overall shield to begin with, you know? So this is where we're headed. And category eight, which I have yet to see, is going to be much closer to this. And who, wants for, who wants to pay for some guys to have a bunch of shields? That's going to be really expensive. Hey, if you figure out how to do this, you're the world's first trillionaire, okay? <laughs> well, that's the thing. I mean, we're, we're probably coming to the end of copper. We're not quite there yet, but definitely the writing's on the wall. I mean, I certainly I work in video as well, and we're coming to the end there as well, although people think the end has already arrived, and I'm going, no, no, we're not there yet. We still have some life in copper, but yeah. Okay, eventually. Everybody wants to transmit video this stuff. It's really important because there's a lot of money. Well, duh. Of course. It's all about money. <laughs> yeah. So, here, I'll, I'll pass these around so you can play with these. And you guys are touchy-feely guys and gals. So. Yes. No, I don't, I, don't, I don't think so. Well, can you read a part number on that? If it's 1872, that's solid. 1872, 1874. Solid. Solid conductor. So what's the gauge that solid? 23. That was the first cable that we made 23. That was the largest wire we could fit into the connector we were using at the time. That's precisely why. I mean, we also made specials for people that were 22 gauge, but I don't know who made those connectors, I'll tell you that. And it didn't last very long because it's just too huge, you know. And that's the problem, is size versus, you know. I mean, you have to put a connector on. I don't have to, you have to, you know. He has to, you know. I just get to make the stuff. Basically, this is the set that you have right now on the uh, 1872. We're back to Yes. No, no. You could bend that 2,000 times before it breaks. That what you don't realize is that you're thinking 1950 thoughts. When they didn't know how to anneal cable or they didn't even anneal it, which is put it back in the oven to make it okay. Now we've known how to do that for a long, long time. And the whole point of flexing and breaking is a non-issue. In fact, I'll bet you I could give you 10 minutes to try and stop that cable by doing this, and you couldn't do it. <laughs> or it's it crappy cables from China where they don't anneal. I could show you some stuff that would just curl your hair about how these cables can be bent and still work. <laughs> Well, hey, we have stuff. Let's do it. Just do it today. Let's do it here. We'll take some cables, tighten a knot, look at it. Tie wraps. What about tie wraps, evenly spaced cables? Ah, uh, yeah, now, see, you're getting me off the subject here, but uh, oh, uh, no, that's a, for, that's a real problem, which is why, certainly in the data world, they've gone to Velcro ties almost entirely. Yeah, and in the video world as well, I, I have a major talk about that, which is you put ties at exactly the same distance and you've picked a wavelength, a frequency, and you can see that and all the harmonics. You can kill your line with wire ties very easily. You definitely affect stuff like HD signal. Yeah, absolutely. It's just sort of the reality of some of the data. It is, and it's about getting higher and higher frequency. When you were back at analog video or 16 megahertz bandwidth data, nothing mattered. 
the wavelengths were so long, you could do anything and it all worked okay. So are these Cat 6, Cat 7, Cat 8 cables? Yes. Are these uh, impacted the same way or even worse? Worse, because the wavelengths are shorter and shorter and shorter in the data, which means anything you do that's, that's wavelength related will show up more and more. What's the bandwidth on these? Again? Well, Cat 6 is 250 megahertz. Cat 6A, which is the, oh, that's what he's carrying, Cat 6A, that's 500 megahertz is the standard. Our cables will go up to 625 megahertz, but the standard says 500 megahertz. That's also CAT 6A, believe it or not, out of Europe. Not available here. Good luck. Uh, okay. Okay. I'm running out of time here, so. There's our first version of CAT 6A, and the thing about CAT 6A, which is very interesting, first of all, 10 gig cable, you know, uh, 500 megahertz per pair. Our cable will do 625 megahertz, but the standard says 500 megahertz. And the whole point is, you'll notice it has that divider in it now to push the pairs apart. And the interesting thing is, if you look at the blue cable and the, this yellow cable, I'll pass them both out. You look closely at the divider in these, it's completely unlike any other divider that you've ever seen because it's more, in fact, I can show you a better picture up here. Hold on a second. I don't know if you can see that very well, but, oh, I can have an even better picture. That's what it looks like inside. It looks almost like an H. You see those two H's? Because what's happening is that when you have two cables at 10 gig, those frequencies are so high, 500 megahertz, that the, the cables see the cables next to it. And the pair that's twisted a specific way sees its identical pair in the next cable. This is called alien crosstalk. And that's what kills 10 gig is cables looking at other cables, not the crosstalk between the four pairs. So this thing actually divides the four pairs and it prevents the cables from getting too close to each other. That's why the ends of the H's, you can actually see on the outside of the jacket, you know, this is the world's ugliest cable by design to keep the other cables away. And this is why this is unshielded and still works at 10 gig. Most 10 gig out there is shielded for this very reason that they can't get the interaction between the cables to stop, so they simply put a shield around it, and that's fine, except what that does is increase the crosstalk inside the cable, because it doesn't let any energy outside of the cable, and so the crosstalk gets worse and worse inside the cable. And one other thing we've done here, which is kind of clever, there are a bunch of patents you're looking at here, is you notice they're not on the same level, the two pairs are farther away than the other two pairs, so we can pick the pairs that are most likely to talk to each other within the bundle and move those farther apart as well. So I'll tell you, if you think this is easy, hey, go ahead and make this in your garage, you know, no problem. Yeah, this is really, really hard to do. I, I still see through all the generations of these, it's four twisted pairs. How are you getting the increased bandwidth? Just because the cable is better performance. There are new specs that we have to meet. 23 gauge. Well, 23 gauge is one of the tricks that we can use to get... The twisting is more twist per inch also. Uh, now, see, we're going to talk about twisting in the next section. So I'm saving all my twisting talk. You know, we'll twist, twist the night away. But doesn't the insulation make a difference on the cable? Absolutely. Absolutely. Speed? Absolutely. So it's insulation, not the copper one? Well, it's both. But the insulation is really, when you think about it, when you put a signal down a copper wire, it turns into a magnetic field. That magnetic field is in the plastic. So the plastic is very, very specific about how well that cable will work. And the, the kinds of plastic that we use on these wires is very specific. Some of them are foamed. In other words, they have air in them because that's a better dielectric than the plastic itself. And the point is, where do we go from here, you know? And there's also the precision of how we do this because, you know, each of these pairs has to be very, very precisely built or else the impedance will be wrong and you'll have reflections and you, know, you could... And which is why back in the old, old days... Oh, I shouldn't start talking. I'm going to start about talking about twisting pairs. We'll get to twisted pairs in a minute. So Steve, one question. On this wire, you have both braiding as well as the Yeah, yeah. And Yeah. Now, That's called... I call that European paranoia. Mm -hmm. But it's Belden. Oh, yes, Belden, Europe. Yeah. <laughs> And, and eventually, you could buy it here. Eventually, we're going to have this international catalog, if I have my wish. 
And you could just look in the catalog and it says, so this one's made in Europe, so what? Who cares? I want a million feet of that. Here it comes. How critical is the I like base, but how critical is it for this overkill? Depends on what you're trying to do. I mean, these are really intended for things like industrial applications, where it might be, you know, yeah, then we're talking about ruggedness and, you know, flexibility and things like that as well. So, actually, I think we're probably at a good place to, to segue into the twisting story. Shall I start talking about twisting? Because I have a story about twisting. That's the thing. Everybody says they understand that these pairs are twisted. You do understand that all four pairs are twisted differently. How do you get to those numbers? Well, here's a fantastic story. Back in the days of Category 3, this is the beginning of time, okay? Category 3. AT&T, who was the big mommy of, uh, of these kinds of cables, decided what they would do, instead of doing the way we had always done it, which is twist and measure and twist and measure and twist and measure and twist and measure, and after six months of that or whenever you're sick and tired of it, you stop, you look at the best numbers you got, and you use those four numbers. Now, they said, no, no, that's, that's, that's you know, dark ages. We'll do it the real way. And what they did was rent a cray. And they put all the information into the Cray. This is category three, 16 megahertz. It took two weeks on a Cray. That was $10 million to generate four numbers. And the funny thing is, how do you patent a number? You know? <laughs> well, you don't. And so the funny thing is, after they brought out their four numbered, you know, category three, Everybody else's category three kind of looked the same as that, you know? It's like, what a coincidence. <laughs> and the problem is, then along came category four and then category five. And by category five at 100 megahertz, there is no computer on earth, even today, that could calculate that the, the, the reactions are so complex there's no computer that would tell you what the four twist ratios, what the optimal twist ratios would be. So guess what? We twist and we measure and we twist and we measure. And twist. <laughs> We're back to the old way and we have no other way of doing it. If you could figure out a way to generate those four numbers, those four numbers would easily be worth a billion dollars if you could generate those four numbers. So, and then somehow keep it to yourself, exactly. You know. Okay. Okay, so uh, uh, this here is a, is a look at twist rates in cables. And these, all of these cables and others are over on the table in plastic bags that you can look at and compare them for yourself. So uh, have the, the twist rates on these wires are different from pair to pair in order to minimize the crosstalk. And uh, the, the question came up, are the colors twisted the same on different manufacturers' wires? Because the connectors, you wire the same, you wire them by color, so the connectors are always wired the same, but if the pairs are differently twisted, is that gonna change anything? So I went and looked at uh, different pairs. This is a Monoprice Cat5e that I cut apart, and on all of these, I eyeballed them and arranged them so that the tighter twist is at the top and the lesser twist is at the bottom, and then I kind of guessed in between. And it's not a precise science. You can decide it yourself. I didn't go and measure, but I put a scale in here so that you could see. So there's one. So the orange is the tightest and the blue is the worst. Here's a general cable, uh, and the blue is the tightest, and the brown is the least tight. Yeah, or orange. Yeah. What? That looks more like orange at the bottom. I think and this brown is brown. Is this is orange. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, sorry. You're. A, I guess that's the difference in the screen. You're going to have to rely on me for the colors then. Yeah, that's obviously. Fine. <laughs> so it's blue, green, orange, brown. And we'll go to the next one. And this is a Gepco. Uh, enhanced cat six and it's orange, brown, green, blue. And some of these are pretty close calls and if you look at it tomorrow you would say, oh no, this is backwards, but this is a general thing. So here's orange, brown, green, blue on this general cable. And the twist 
Whisk ratio seems different for each cable too. Yeah. 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 Well, that's the thing. There's no spec for it. It's you meet these numbers, and whatever you do, if you could make it do it with straight wires, then knock yeah. yourself out. Here's a GEPCO, and it looks like blue, green, brown, orange. Uh, it's doubtful. It, you could go either way on that one. The brown looks like it could be lesser. But Do they specify what these twist ratios are? No. In fact, it's secret. In fact, nobody will tell you what they are. Here's a Panduit that's br uh, orange, brown, green, blue, maybe. Although those are pretty close. Those look pretty... I, I had a hard time telling. And here's a Belden Brilliance, which we are going to mess with. Uh, it's a green jacketed cable. And this is orange, brown, blue, green. Let me talk about this one for just a second. Okay. Um, the interesting thing is this is a low skew cable, meaning it's intended for running video, RGB or VGA or something like that. Oh, good. And okay. so the delivery of the four pairs is very, very close to each other. There's very low skew is what that's called. And the way we do that, of course, is playing with the twist ratios. So the twist ratios here are probably closer than they normally would be in our regular cables, but you get this other thing instead. So this is the problem of making cables, is you have this kind of reaction. Plus, we might even change the amount of insulation on the wires to slow down or speed up a signal so that they come in on time even though the twist ratios are different. You think about that, you know, you're doing one thing that goes this way and you want to go the other way. And it gets really complicated. And I also heard about it uh, for video and low skew applications that the, the twist rates varies over distance per pair. Is that true? Is that it can. So I, I'm, we're looking at a specific point in the cable, and this is in this order. Yeah. Some other point in the length of the cable would be a completely different Absolutely. order. Absolutely. Okay, so there you go on that. What if you plug it into an Ethernet port? Well, this actually will run this Ethernet. Is. That's the whole point. We're trying to pick you know, the midpoint so it runs Ethernet okay, but it also runs RGB okay. The thing is, we also make cables that run RGB great that fail in Ethernet because they're intended only to run video. You know, and of course you could run perfect Ethernet and the video wouldn't be so great. This is running video directly on the four pairs, you understand, not analog video analog as video. Ethernet. But it's analog <coughs> video, which is... I'm sorry? It's analog video. Yes, this is an analog video running on four pairs of wire. Which is going away hopefully really soon. <laughs> hey, yeah, like, like analog, no, I like know. analog, I know. like I analog. I know. <laughs> I think by the time it's gone, you and I will be long gone. Well, this computer will be obsolete in five years, and I assume the projector may be too, so. Well, the yeah, but you think, video out as well, you think there won't be a VGA output? I mean, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, right, right. Well, and I think that's the end of the twisted discussion here. Okay. So. Oh, I should mention one other thing, which is, think about this. You know, you twist, you measure, you twist, you measure, and then you pick your best four numbers. And the problem with that is then you have to have really accurate ways of measuring the twisting so you can go back and reproduce what you did before or else you can't do anything. And so every company does this and we, you know, I have something I've never seen, I've never been allowed to see, which I call the twistometer, you know, okay. which precisely measures the length of the twist, something called the lay length of the cables so that we can go back and reproduce it later on when we make the cable, you know, after years of doing this research. Yes. So, general question, is there any spec on when you have an excess length of cable, do you coil it, if you coil it at what radius, or do you lay it out straight, or it doesn't matter? I will tell you this, it's very, very simple. The more random the cables, the better they work. If you put them in a shape like this, this is a deadly shape. That's a deadly shape, and we're going to look at this later, that's why it's done this way. I mean, when you think about this, this is a giant inductor, right? Mm -hmm. So you're already creating, you know, half of a transformer here with this cable. And, you know, will this show up? Probably. How much? Depends on how good the cable is, you know. But, uh, yeah, this is bad, bad stuff. And then, I think Belden is doing a different set of cables for analog versus digital as well, right? Well, sure. I mean, we make 6,000 kinds of cable. Are there specific characteristics you're going to address today? Or? No. Well, no, in terms of the data cables, this is pretty much it. Although, I, I could talk about using these cables to run analog signals themselves directly 
And, and uh, is this okay? Can I take a side trip here? Yeah. Uh, where, oh. Here, let me you. Are you on your no, no. This is just a box. It's not even produced by Belden. It's by a company called ETS down in Fremont, California. It has four audio connectors here, and the middle connector is an RJ45. And all it does is take the four balance line pairs and feed them into four balance line pairs in the middle. And so you just take any kind of data cable, the better the better, and you plug it in, and you plug one in the other end, and you have four audio connections, analog or digital. If it's digital, you have eight, actually, because you can do two channels per pair. And if you use an unshielded cable, then pin one isn't doing anything, so you can't do phantom power. If you plug in a shielded cable that enables pin one, you can do phantom power and stuff like that. So, and this is just using, see what's inside here? Well, there's nothing. There's nothing inside, just wire. Although it's heavy, I call that marketing. You know? It's like, oh, <laughs> yeah, oh, must be something inside. All these transformers just up. No, nothing inside. Marketeering. Marketeering. But aren't the uh, Ethernet connectors, don't they have built in transformers at, no. in there? No. No. Nothing. No. Huh. Okay. Just wire. Uh, Mac has a comment. There, there are a couple of outfits that make a similar thing that does have really wretched little transformers. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. If you ever see one, make sure you stay below minus 20, nothing below 100 hertz, because it will saturate. Yeah, exactly. Now, see, there's nothing in here to saturate, mm -hmm. just wire. I mean, the funny thing is, they, they, this company sold like one a month. Nobody knew what this was until Obama got inaugurated the first time, and there were hundreds of these running. All the audio you heard worldwide was running through these boxes. And so now they're selling one an hour. Well, no, video would be different because that would require a transformer to go from 75 ohms to 100 ohms. This is analog or digital audio, in which case the 100 ohm pairs of the data pairs is close enough to the digital 110 ohms, it works just fine, and in analog it doesn't matter. Yes. And there's an industry standard device called a, a, a Balan or a Balan. Yeah. Balan. People make them and uh, they're designed to go back and forth between these yeah. types of cables and other types. Yeah, from coax to twisted pairs and stuff like that. You just keep it, it's a twisted pair to a twisted pair. You've got Ford, Ford 9451. No, this is analog. better than it's any, XLR. this is better than any twisted pair we've ever made, actually. On the back side of that XLR, you just tie into one of these pairs. Yeah. 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 The only problem, of course, it comes four pairs to a bundle, you know, which is why this is one of the first products I brought out as product line manager, one pair data cable. They were going to shoot me. They said, "Who's going to buy that? Nobody's going to buy one pair data cable. That doesn't make any sense at all. We can't make it fast enough now." So everybody at Belden who said that before is now angry. You see, you didn't tell me. Yes, I did. This is the world's best audio cable, is what this is. <laughs> it's also the physically quietest cable we've ever made. That's just one pair Cat5e stranded patch cable. It's nothing special. It's a, it's a bonded pair, so it's really quiet. It's That's chill. all. Unshielded. 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 Simple, simple, simple. And what do you use it for? Audio. Anything you want, as long as it's not phantom power or something like that, mm -hmm. it'll run audio. And it's tiny and comes in different colors. And it's three wires or two and a half hours? No, there's no ground, no shield. Oh, it is. Just a twisted pair. One twisted pair. I'd like to get a clarification for the group about a comment that Dan made earlier when we were first got onto the topic. Yes. Uh, Dan had, had mentioned that the various manufacturers used different colors for the different twist ratios. And I just wanted to get a clarification for all of us that, that in, the in the long run, does that or does not uh, that have any significance? It's not supposed to have a significance. That the colors are part of the standard. But the standard doesn't say which one is the tightest or the loosest or, you know, what the crosstalk between the pairs is supposed to be. It just says, here are the crosstalk requirements for the whole cable. And I understand so, that, but when Dan mentioned it, you know, he... He kind of mentioned it in the form of a question, and the question yeah. never got answered, so I just wanted it to be covered. Yeah. I mean, certainly you could make good cable and you can make bad cable. 
and it's very clear. And that's the, one of the things when we get into the plugging it in today, hopefully we'll see some difference between good and bad. And, and uh, it's not hard to make bad cable. The question came up in the course of a discussion that I read on a forum about wiring a connector and looking at, looking at this standard here. We're pretty much always on 568B, it seems. And yeah, which is the AT&T standard, by the way. Okay. They, they rule the world. And the, the, the orange color is this yeah. pair, the blue color is this pair, the brown color is this pair, and the green is split. color is split. So there's a, a space in the wires. Those, those wires are farther apart. And if I understood the discussion correctly, it was what happens when you have the tight pair as the far apart one versus the loose pair, and how does that compare to these other guys where the split is not necessarily, in the wires is not necessarily as uh, far apart. So at, at high bit rates, something changes. There. Yes, and this is a huge problem. The reason why we have this, and, and in fact, there's a split pair in A as well. You know, it's just the, a yeah, different pair that's split. Different pair. But the, the whole point is this was to make it backward compatible to the telephone, believe it or not. That's the only reason? That's the only reason. But that was a big reason when it was done. Well, yes. In 1970, that's a huge reason. So don't mess with that, yes. you see. But yeah, because of that, we're now paying the price. Although you look at like a category six, this is a 10 gig patch cable here, which I'll pass out. Look at the twists inside here, and you realize one of the things is that, that we've done all we can do to push the twists all the way to the end of the connector before, they are, before they're split and moved, you know? And that, the whole point is because the less distance it spins apart, the better it works. So if the reason you do the split pair is just for, for compatibility. Correct. Not performance. No. If the twist, what? No, it goes against performance. In fact, there is a standard of where all four pairs are just in line called USOC and nobody uses it. Right. So it doesn't matter which pair is twisted tighter. Well, it, it does after this. <laughs> after this, yes. Yeah. But I mean, this is, this is definitely a major problem along the, as you get out, as you leave. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think you brought up the question I was going to ask. Is Belgium involved in making connectors? The yep. question of how far it's untwisted before you terminate is critical. And Absolutely. Connectors ripped on twist quite a bit. Absolutely. Case. And that's getting into our next subject. I was going to say, this is a good time if you want to jump change. in, Kurt, any time here. Yeah, Kurt, come on up front and let's get you going here. Sure. 